for this particular session we will speak on skeletal dysplasias. Skeletal dysplasias are common, particularly for some reason or other in my practice in India we see much many more than abroad in USA. Maybe several factors are involved, consanguinity may be one of them, but anyway this is rather common. But then how do you approach, there must be a practical approach to get to your diagnosis. And then there are all sorts of uh, misunderstandings about dysplasia. Some people call it dysplasia, some people call it dysostosis. So what is dysplasia and what is dysostosis? Dysplasia is disturbance in bone structure or even modeling which assumes disturbance in growth intrinsic to bone, growth intrinsic to bone. Whereas dysostosis, malformation of individual bones, either in single or in combination, not a systemic type of disturbance. Callan et al. in clinical imaging, they have described the, and evaluated skeletal species. Monitoring germ cell mutations using skeletal species as a model, they have monitored germ cell mutations. 9.5 million births they have analyzed and 15 per, they calculated that 15 per 1 lakh of people. And that is incidence. Evaluation of, by they have evaluated long bones and thoracic cage, hands and feet and cranium. You don't have to do the entire skeletal survey. Just these, evaluating by these three entities can come to a conclusion. And then we analyze these skeletal dysplasia. Supposing a film comes, how do you analyze? Is it a sclerosing dysplasia? Is it dense? And then site of affliction. Is it epiphyseal, metaphyseal or diaphyseal? and a miscellaneous group in these sclerosing dysplasias. Most common or I shouldn't say most common, most obvious is osteopetrosis, otherwise called Albert-Steinberg disease or otherwise called marble bones. It's autosomal recessive, there are two forms, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. Look at these films, long tubular bones, all are dense the spine, ribs, every bone is sclerotic and dense. No question of a differential diagnosis. And bone in a bone, because of the growth pattern, difference in the degrees of growth, you get a bone in a bone, a primitive bone, then as a child grows up, another bone, that's why you get a bone in bone appearance. One of the critical features in the marble bone disease. Again, a similar fashion in the lower ends and the upper ends, bone in a bone. And what are the dysplasias? We are talking about the sclerosing bone dysplasias with increased bone density, one osteopetrosis, another differential diagnosis comes pycnodysostosis. This is another entity called dysosteosclerosis, van becomes disease, sclerosteosis, Camaruti Engelmann's disease, Miles disease, EYLGS, Pachyderma periostosis, osteoectasia with hyperphosphatasia. These are the various entities. These are all have a base, the developmental or congenital basis. Echinodosostosis, frontal bossing, also you can get in marble bone disease. Vermilion bones, which generally you don't get in marble bone disease. Obtuse angle of the mandible, typical feature. Osteosclerosis, common for most of the cases. Clavicular hypoplasia, specific for pycnodysostosis. And then acroosteolysis. But then, craniocleidodysostosis also, you can get acroosteolysis, clavicular dysplasia, midline defects, and vermilion bones. Then, how do you differentiate? Here, there is a density of the bones which you don't get in craniocleido dysplasia. Actually, this pycnodysostosis is supposed to be a hybrid between marble bone disease and craniocleido dysplasia. Look at the film, the chest film. Look at the clavicles. They are dysplastic. They are not normally well developed. Again, look at the mandible. Obtuse angle, almost like a straight line. No angle in the mandible, typical of pycnodysostosis. Single picture of a baby, pycnodysostosis. 
acroosteolysis, distal phalanges, and one on the fractures occur like uh, marble bone disease, fractures easily occur, this of course has a fracture and then the hands show typical acroosteolysis with sclerosis of the bones. Again to repeat, no disastrosis, what are the radiological features, persistent wantonness, both anterior and posterior, bohemian bones, obtuse angle of the mandibles, density of the bones, well preserved medulla, whereas in some of the osteopetrosis cases the medulla also is obliterated, displacia of the clavicle, acroosteolysis, just a repetition so that it will be impressed upon the radiological findings to make a spot diagnosis. Then we come to endosteal hyperostosis, one Buchum's type. Occasionally we see it's not as common as marble bone or nodosteosis. Radiographic findings are similar, but more severe than those in the dominant form of the disease. Specific abnormalities include periosteal excrescences, vertebral bones, osteosclerotic and enlarged ribs, and clavicles, and increased radio density of the spine particularly prominent in the spinous processes. These differentiate from the earlier mentioned sclerotic dysplasias. Von Bochum, again there is obtuse angle of the mandible, but the hyperostosis is peculiar to this disease. It is not just as you see, there are no vermeian bones. And it is not typical of marble bone disease, there is an obtuse angle. These are all variations. 20 year old man comes with a headache, look at the mandible. Look at the skull, marked thickening of the skull, the sclerosis, mandibular changes, another case. Again, CT shows the thickening of the skull. Spine, no spina bifida to think of, echinodesastosis, even the ribs are involved. Bones, looks like a diaphyseal dysplasia, progressive diaphyseal, the diaphyses are widened. But there is increased density also, difficult to differ differentiate from progressive diaphyseal dysplasia or the so-called angular muscle disease. But then angular of the mandible and others differentiate from the center. Sclerostosis, another variation. Radiographs show a progressive marked hyperostosis of the skull and mandible. Vertebral end plates and pedicles in the bones of the pelvis are sclerotic. The long bones are enlarged, cortical hyperostosis, moderate alteration of the bone contours and lack of normal diaphyseal con constriction which we have seen earlier. Pathological fractures, they do not occur, fortunately. And there is disastiosclerosis, Wurtz type. You do not have to know the details of it, but occasionally when you come across, you have to classify them into the well-known progressive type of disorders. Radiographic findings include endosteal thickening in the cortex of the tubular bones with encroachment on the medullary cavity. The skull osteosclerosis begins at the base and subsequently involves the facial bones, especially the mandible, the lateral bone, namely the mandible lacks the normal antigonal notch which we have described earlier and the mandibular canal may be prominent. Then we come to Piles disease, P-Y-L apostrophe It is also called metaphyseal dysplasia. Here it involves mostly the metaphyses, wide metaphyses, Florentine Flask deformity of long bones. This is due to developmental abnormality, growth abnormality, wide medial ends of clavicles, mild hyperostosis of the skull, poor aeration of the sinuses, prominent uh, supraorbital ridge, mild prognathism. Prognathism is also present, it is mild, undertubulation of bones and metaphyseal flaring. Look at the metaphyseal flaring and undertubulation of the metaphysis in the forearm bones. In the skull, there is sclerosis and actually you do not see the mandible that clearly here. Again, metaphysis are involved and in the femora, Allen myel class type of appearance, under tubulation and in the clavicle also, medial ends of the clavicles are involved. Even the particular ends of the ribs are also involved. Same thing, clavicular changes and in the metaphysis of the femora. Then we come to another entity called malariostosis, flowing hyperostosis in the bones. 
wax dripping appearance from one side of the candle. And then could be monostatic, could be monomyelic, one side of the limb or polyester. Whatever it is, it flows on one side. Actually, it involves the sclerotomes. And look at the foot. Only the third metatarsal is involved, flowing hyperostosis. It also enters into the tarsal and calcane bone also. Then we come to osteopoikilosis, spotty bone disease, may be associated with dermatofibrosis, lenticularis disseminata. It is also called Bushki or Endorf syndrome. We don't have to know the proper names, but it is respectable to have some human values to remember the authors who have described this first time. Osteopyclosis, osteopathia, cadences, disseminata, these are all the various names that you come across. First described by Albert Schoenberg and others in early 1900s. Autosomal dominant in transmission, found to become more prominent in succeeding generations in some cases. The exact cause is unknown. It is a genetic disorder. 27 year old pelvis AP view. Look at the spots, particularly towards the joint, articular ends of the bones also obturator ring. Again, the pelvis and the ribs show the spine, rarely you see the in the spine, not common. And then the spine may not show in regular films, occasionally you have to take the CT or MRI, MRI also is not that sensitive CT, here you could see osteopoikilos in the pelvis and scapula, lesions are found adjacent to the establishment glenoid, the marrow. Lesions in the skull, spine, ribs and clavicles are rare. Size ranges from 1 to 10 millimeters in diameter. Actually, you can call them bone islands, multiple bone islands. Again, asymptomatic pelvis, MRI, association with cutaneous and subcutaneous fibrous pea-sized nodules in the skin also or subcutaneous area, 25%. Other reported abnormalities, giant cell tumor, osteosarcoma, lumbar canal stenosis. In 15 to 20 percent of cases, mild joint pains with or without joint effusion. Laboratory findings are normal. There is no use doing any laboratory findings, namely serum calcium, serum phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, acid phosphatase, without osteoblastic metastasis from prostatic cancer. Another case of foot and ankle osteopyclosis. No question of a differential diagnosis. This, whereas this is a bone island in the neck of the femur, intertrochanteric area, and bone islands in the tibia, and again the femur, and in the elbow, in the lower end of the human. These are multiple bone islands. Sometimes you may get only one limb, one or two, or in the skeleton you may get one or two. This has no significance. It is also called insular compact. That is a bone island, a cortical bone in the spongiosa. Osteopathia striata, whereas those are bone islands, these are striata, longitudinal overlapping syndromes do occur in coexistence of two or more bone islands. Bone islands can occur or osteopyclosis can occur as well as osteopathia striata. Look at the columns, vertical columns of dense bone. And then we come to another disease or disorder called Comorati Engelmann's disease. I described earlier. Otherwise called progressive diaphyseal dysplasia. There is another variety in this craniodiaphyseal dysplasia. It is rather rare. Generally, long tubular bones are also involved. The mid shafts are wide hyperostosis. And then coming back to sclerotic lesions, differential diagnosis, apart from these dysplasias or dysostosis, you can have Paget disease. Myelofibrosis, diffuse sclerosis, metastasis, extremely rare to involve the entire skeleton, but once in a while in prostate or person of the breast, you can see hypoparathyroidism, systemic disorder, renal osteodystrophy, sclerosing angiometosis, actually again multiple type of sclerotic islands, neurosis, diffuse, fibrous sclerosis, again multiple sclerotic islands or hyperostosis. Now we come to miscellaneous syndromes. So far, we have an approach, radiological approach to sclerotic type of disorders and differential diagnosis also we have mentioned. 
miscellaneous syndromes, Achondro Basile, inherited disorder of the bone growth, most common type of dwarfism, short stature, short limbs, high and upper arm definitely, so called rhizomelic type of dwarfism, head normal or sometimes large and abnormal so called trident hand, Little pictures at the hand, short metacarpals and Marked kyphosis, waddling gait when the patient frontal washing, hypotonia, bowed legs, spinal stenosis, short stubby hands and feet. You see the clinical pictures classical. And look at the vertebral column also. There is dorsal wedging. Again, bones are of normal density, they are sclerotic dysplasias, short stubby limbs and fingers. A trumpet type appearance of the long bones. Typical, I don't have to describe it that much. Clinically, you can diagnose mild variations may occur between the normal and abnormal. Because normally, some dwarf people you could see, not all dwarf people are achondroplasties. Pelvis, peculiar type of iliac bones, long bones, distal ends only are affected, metaphysical, flaring and notching resulting in cone epiphysis in this